in COVID-19 school absences by measures of deprivation. Thank you very much, Liz. Can, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Best to start at the beginning. Hi, yeah. Um, thanks, Liz, and thanks, Alison, for an, inviting me to, to speak um, to, um, today. Um, really looking forward to the rest of the session. And yeah, I, I worry that I might, again, raise more questions than I answer, but I, I look forward to hearing everyone's perspective. So I'm Tristan Leng. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Warwick. And throughout the pandemic at Warwick, we've been doing a couple of things with regards to schools. One thing we've been doing is modeling different control strategies within schools. But another thing we've been doing is, is examining data collected at the school level and exploring the trends in that data through time. So a bit of context. So throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, kids have missed a lot of school. And this has been for, for a, a number of reasons. Sometimes there's been complete school closures. Sometimes children have had to isolate because they've been identified as a close contact of someone in a school operating a bubbling system. And sometimes kids have missed lots of school because of the sheer volume of cases within their age group. And one of the worries about this is that these absences um, are deepening educational inequalities in England and the rest of the UK. What control measures have been implemented in schools in the UK? So a, a number of them, a number of measures have been implemented, but there are two that I think are central to what's been happening in schools. Firstly, throughout the 2020-21 academic year, schools implemented a isolation of close contacts policy. So if an individual was identified as um, COVID positive, all of their identified close contacts would have to isolate for a period. In secondary schools, and since, Mar since March 2021, this has been implemented alongside a policy of twice weekly mass testing using lateral flow tests. Um, and the combination of these has the potential to, to possibly lead to many absences. Um, and throughout the pandemic, a, a, a range of data has been collected at the school level, um, which we refer to as the educational setting status data. And until the March this year, English schools recorded daily information relevant to COVID-19 using the UK government um, online portal. The data recorded includes daily COVID absences in pupils, daily COVID related absences in staff, but also more um, sort of broad um, indicators about the school. So for example, the number of pupils on roll, the number of pupils eligible for free school meals, the number of pupils with a social worker. Since the, the data has been rolled back and now a more limited set of data is recorded weekly, um, and just a couple of notes on the data I'm presenting today. So the analyses I'm presenting focus on state-funded schools in England. Data is recorded on independent schools, but it's not, not included here. And we consider the period October 2020 to March 22, because these dates correspond to a couple of the formatting changes in the data. So firstly, what, what do I mean by COVID-related absence? These are delineated within the data into, into different categories. Firstly, we have confirmed cases of COVID-19. These are absences that are accompanied by a positive test. Secondly, you have suspected cases of COVID-19. So if someone's maybe waiting on a PCR result, that'd be a suspected, suspected case of COVID-19. Or you also have absences due to being asked to isolate. This may be as an identified close contact within the school setting throughout the 2020-21 academic year, or if, for example, a family member is infected, you may uh, people may be asked to isolate um, because of that. So a contact with someone outside of the school setting. In in the UK, we have um, this measure that Alison already talked about called the Index of Multiple Deprivation, which is the sort of the government's official measure of relative deprivation in England. And it's based on a range of indicators, including income, employment, education, health, crime. 
um, living environment. And these are collected at a really local scale. So it gives us a picture of deprivation in terms of these areas called lower layer super output areas, which are areas of England divided into about populations of about 1,500 people. So the first thing I'm, I'm going to touch upon is regional inequality. So if we take the mean index of multiple deprivation of the areas that comprise a local authority in England, and a local authority is England divided into just 317 regions, and we rank the LTLAs by the local authorities by their um, mean deprivation, we can see the, the heterogeneity in inequality. So deprived areas are focused in the Northwest, Northeast, Greater London and the Birmingham area. And so we can think of deprivation in this way. And so, for example, we can compare COVID related absences in schools from the most deprived areas to absences in schools in the least deprived areas. And like Alison, I split things into deciles, but I think unhelpfully, I've sort of, sort of switched, <laughs> switched the ordering around. So my first decile corresponds to the least deprived, most deprived. And this is thinking of things in terms of the, the local authority scores are based on. And we can see that the trend, considering confirmed COVID-19 cases in schools, we can see that the trend that Alison touched upon holds true throughout the 2020 up until um, the summer holidays of 2021 um, with the orange bars, the I corresponding to the most deprived decile being higher than the green bars corresponding to the least deprived decile. After the summer holidays, however, this switches round. So we see that high levels of confirmed COVID cases occur in schools in the least deprived uh, LTLAs. So, and this persists for, for primary and secondary schools. That was in the last slide, I was looking at confirmed COVID cases, but of course that's not the only reason people are absent because of COVID. They could be asked to be, um, asked to isolate as a close contact. And we can see that the confirmed cases translates, the trends in confirmed cases translates to trends in all absences. So with schools operating in isolation of close contact policy in the 2021 academic term, this translates to much higher levels of absences in schools in more deprived LTLAs. So here I'm looking at um, this the sort of regional variation in, in cases. So on the left, is the, the map I've shown before of LTLAs ranked by the mean index of multiple deprivation. In the center, I've ranked LTLAs by the mean um, number of absences um, in the LTLA across the 2020-21 the academic year. And on the right, I've done the same, but from September 21 to 2022. And comparing the cent central to the right columns, one of the, the interesting things is these seem to be the, the inverse of each other, right? So areas that had high levels of absences in the 2020-2021 20, term had low levels of absences um, this term and vice versa in general. So up until now, I've been, I've been thinking of deprivation at, at the regional level, but we have data at the level of schools, so we can also consider deprivation at, at the school level. And in, in this analysis, we consider two, two measures. So firstly, we can look at the percentage of pupils on roll at a school who are eligible for free school meals. This data is collected in, in the educational setting status data. And eligibility for free school meals depends upon family income. But I suppose a limitation of this is it, it only depends on income and not other factors. 
And it may be a good measure of deprivation, but possibly not its inverse. It might not tell us much about affluence of, of a school. Another option is to use the mean IMD of the postcodes of pupils on roller school. So if we know the, the postcodes of a pupil, and we know the IMD of the local, the LSOA, which is a small area of the pupil's postcode, we can use that as a proxy for pupils um, IMD. Again, the IMD is not a measure of affluence, it's a, it's a measure of deprivation in um, multiple, uh, multiple directions. And this sort of, I suppose the limitation is this sort of data isn't and can't be um, available publicly. Um, here, we, we consider both measures. So firstly, let's compare how these measures compare at the sort of regional level. So if we rank LTLAs by their mean index of multiple deprivation, and then we compare the LTLAs ranked by the percentage of pupils eligible for free school meals, or by the mean IMD of pupils within that within an LTLA, we can see a close correspondence between all of these different measures, which is what we'd expect. This gives us confidence that our, our measures are, are, are measuring deprivation, right? Um, and again, comparing on the x-axis, the percentage of pupils eligible for free school meals, and on the y-axis, the mean pupil index multiple deprivation, we can see that these two measures are highly correlated, but there's not a perfect correlation, right? So if we compare the, the, the tenth decile of schools um, by the percentage of pupils that are eligible for free school meals, this is going to be different to the, the tenth decile by the mean pupil index of multiple deprivation. So, so they tell us slightly different things. And here, I think this is this is a really important point, but I think the graphs are slightly confusing. So, so I'll explain. I'll, ex, I'll explain them. So here, below each dot represents a school, and each LTLA is shaded a different color. And as we move from left to right along the x-axis, we have the different LTLAs ranked by their um, by their mean IMD. And then on the y-axis, we have our two different measures. So on, if we, if we just consider the left plot for the moment, we have the percentage of pupils eligible for free school meals. And so if we look at the rightmost of that of, of this figure, we can see that within the most deprived LTLA in England, we still have a lot of variability in the percentage of pupils for free school meals. We still have some schools that have hardly any pupils who are eligible for free school meals. If we go to the other side of the thing, we still see um, some schools with a high percentage of pupils eligible for free school meals, even in the least deprived areas. So there's significant heterogeneity within um, LTLAs in terms of deprivation at the school level. How do these things compare when we look at inequality um, by these two measures through time? So firstly, considering the percentage of pupils eligible for free school meals as a measure of deprivation. We see the trends that Alison alluded to and that we saw in the regional data echoed once again. So we see higher levels of COVID-19 cases. So here I'm actually plotting all COVID absences, but these trends are, the trends in confirmed cases reflect, are reflected in the trends in all absences. Um, and we see high levels of absences in the most deprived schools by this measure. Once again, this flips after the, after the summer of 2021. This is true in secondary and primary schools. And considering inequality by the mean IMD of pupils, we see this pattern once again. And in fact, it's more pronounced. So instead of showing things through time and just focusing on the first and 10th deciles, here, I'm looking at the mean daily absences in each decile for two different time periods. So on the left, I consider the 2020-21 academic term. And on the right, I consider September, so, so, so since then, right? And the, the trend is clear and stark. 
So for the 2020-2021 academic term, we see absences increase considerably as we move from the least to most supply of decile of schools um, with um, primary schools. So primary schools in the least supply of decile have less than half the absences that in the schools in the most deprived decile. And this is true in each of these three subcategories, although it's slightly harder to see um, for the blue and yellow um, subcategories of confirmed cases, suspected cases. Considering September 21 onwards, we see the trend is reversed, but there's a few things to notice here. One is the number of the orange portion. So pupils being asked to isolate is a lot smaller. This is because schools are no longer operating an isolation of close contact pulsing. Um, the second thing to note is that looking at the confirmed cases, this trend of decreasing, um, decreasing cases as we increase deprivation is clearly apparent. But a third thing that I thought was interesting is that if we focus on the yellow, yellow sections and we look at that, we actually see that these still increase with deprivation. What does this suggest? These trends are echoed when we use the percentage of people eligible for free school meals as a measure of deprivation as well. And these trends are also reflected in secondary schools when either of these measures, so the percentage of pupils eligible for free school meals or the mean pupil IMD is used as our measure of deprivation. So the previous plots have looked at these things at the national scale, but I suppose one of the, I suppose the thought I had was, are these sort of hiding a regional trend? If, for example, deprivation is focused in particular regions, maybe we're seeing trends on a regional level that are just like presenting as if they're from deprivation. So here I've broken down the England into seven regions that are illustrated in the bottom right corner and looked at the least deprived and most deprived schools within that region. And we can see again that the trend persists at this regional level. So we see higher levels of absences in the most deprived schools um, up until the summer of 2021, um, summer holidays of 2021, and we see this trend reversed afterwards. But there's a couple of um, subcases that I think are slightly interesting. So for example, if we look at the east of England and Greater London, we can see that this shift seems to happen earlier. So if we look at July 2021 in either of those cases, we can see that the, the colored bars which correspond to the least deprived um, deciles are already higher than the most deprived deciles. And what, what, what does this suggest? The last plot showed primary schools, here are secondary schools, the same, same, same trends persist. And so I think it's probably time to start wrapping up and giving some conclusions. So, well, across a range of measures, for primary and secondary schools, there are higher absence levels in more deprived schools in the 2020-21 academic year. And this is true if we take the percentage of pupils eligible for free school meals, or the mean pupil IMD, or if we take just the local area that school is in as its, um, as its measure of deprivation. However, from September 21, this trend has shifted with higher absence levels now observed in least deprived schools. A couple of takeaways from the data that I think are important is one, levels of deprivation at the school level are highly heterogeneous within any local area, and that's true across England. And data recorded at the school level can, can provide a really important data stream to explore a range of COVID related trends. Here we've done it for deprivation, but I think we can do it. This is potentially a really useful resource across a, a range of domains. And yeah, the key questions this brings up are what factors have driven the shift in levels of absences by deprivation? And 
from a policy perspective, how do we design school level control policies that do not exacerbate educational inequalities? So I think Alison has already touched upon these possible explanations to this shift. So is it because of high levels of immunity in um, deprived groups? So the depletion of susceptibles and has this effect been strong enough to change the relative likelihood of effect, infection in deprived and affluent groups? Are there differences in testing behaviors between socioeconomic groups and how are these driven by socioeconomic factors? And has there been shift in contact patterns in different socioeconomic groups? So as restrictions have relaxed, has there been different shifts in contact patterns? Or is there another explanation? Or is there both? Or, 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 or is it a combination of, of the three? Um, so yeah, thanks for listening. I'd just like to acknowledge my, my colleagues at Warwick University who have been working closely with um, throughout, throughout, throughout the pandemic. I'd like to thank John Reed at Lancaster, who, um, whose idea to look at the mean tuple IMD it was. I'd like to thank Alison for, um, for our chats about this and for inviting me to speak. And yeah, I'd like to um, yeah, plug the, the event on the 27th of April once again. So we'll, we'll have a hybrid meeting about controlling COVID in school specifically, and it'd be great to see lots of you there. And you're yeah, happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Tristan. That was really fascinating, um, as I think you can well.